Okay. Um, so we were talking about this chronology. We're going to bring it down to uh, where we can get started on other things. <coughs> Just to fill in the missing pieces here. So this Exodus period under Moses that we discussed would be somewhere around between 14 and 1300 BC. There were some cataclysms at that time. Uh, you know, um, a lot of people speculate about Santorini, the island of Thera, where there was an earthquake and a uh, volcanic eruption. Half of the island uh, fell through like Krakatoa. That would have produced tremendous um, uh, um, results in Egypt. You know, waves, tidal waves, who knows what kind of things. That could have left their impression on the folk imagination. A lot of that could have uh, gone into the poet's memory of the Exodus, how much of it is historical, how much is in it is impossible to say, but I think most of it probably have to do with the folk imagination of the tribal, if you like, poet. That's how things were done in those days, memory. And you know what happened to people's memory. They can't even decide if Scott Peterson did anything up there in, uh, in uh, Northern California. I mean, it's just hopeless. So nothing of the Kobe Bryant case. Everyone's memory is totally different anyway, and then they all mess it all up with their testimony to succeeding generations. And by the time you get down to um, a couple of generations, it's totally um, mythologized. You think even in your life, how much do you know about your great grandparents? You know almost nothing. I don't even know the name of my great grandparents. Most of them. one or two of them. I I mean, they just don't even exist anymore. So before, like, film here or uh, recorded, you know, memory, printing and stuff, these, uh, this data is very uh, questionable. Take the Odyssey as a memory document with uh, Ulysses traveling around the Mediterranean, meeting all sorts of weird monsters and creatures and other odd things happening to him. I'm sure it's based on some reality of sea voyaging around the Mediterranean, but how realistic it is is, is, uh, is questionable in terms of uh, real events. But in the folk memory, this is what might have seemed to have happened to ancestors. The same with the Exodus. I'm sure that something happened if it left a big impression on it. But what exactly happened, I think, has been embellished, obviously, beyond anything that we can discover reality of. But I, you can theorize that this kind of overwhelming uh, physical cataclysms did occur, and it would have left a tremendous memory on everybody anyway, and then that may have become identified with the fact that they're going out. Now, were those slaves all Hebrews? Archaeology now says a lot of the settlements in Palestine were before the Exodus and stuff, and there's a huge argument now about whether the Jews went down, whether they didn't. I'm sure some did. And uh, the memory is there. There is a memory of being slaves in Egypt. I'm sure it has to do probably with the Hyksos period, not the Egyptians enslaving a lot of the people that came down from Syria and uh, Palestine, Transjordan area, after the overthrow of the Semitic Hyksos dynasty. I'm sure that happened. How many of them actually were Hebrews? Whether Hebrews were a class of people is impossible to say. Was there a leader like Moses? You know, Moses is an Egyptian name even today. Ramos, Amos, Tutmos. Almost all the pharaohs had, of a certain group, had that Mos name. And it usually, I think, has to do with son of or something like that. And the Hebrews tried to Hebraicize it in the Bible, say he was called Moshe because we pulled him out of the water. Mo Moshe means to pull out. So, I mean, the Bible always tries to uh, relate the name of someone to some event in his life. Um, but whether Moses' name was Moshe, as the Hebrews say, or Mos, as the Greek manuscripts say, I don't have any idea. Freud says he was an Egyptian. 
and he brought the Egyptian monotheism to the Jews. He brought that in Moses and monotheism. Is that accurate? It's possible. Because Moses needs Aaron as a mouthpiece. He is slow of speech. He looks like an Egyptian. He's an Egyptian, an Egyptian prince. The Jews Hebraicize him by having him an adopted Hebrew child. Could have been, it may not have been. A lot of people say if it looks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. So since Moses did all three of those things, then he was an Egyptian. But, you know, he may not have been. And we don't even know how historical the total story is. But certainly there was a figure of that kind, I think, that really impressed the Hebrews in their folk memory. And I'm sure there was a Joshua too. Uh, you know, what exactly they did, how, how much of what is said about them is something else. So we're in a semi-mythological period. <laughs> Exodus, Joshua, 1200. And under the Judges and Joshua, or Joshua and the Judges, things coalesce. So there are 12 tribe confederations are widespread in the ancient world. They were known in Greece too. Greece all had 12 tribe confederations. Some people say it's because of the taxation system that each tribe was responsible one month of the year for the taxes. Therefore, it was easy to have a 12 tribe confederation. Whether the Hebrews were originally 12 tribes, whether that got you know, absorbed by the poet into the stories about the Jacob's various wives and the children that he managed to acquire through the various wives. That's beautiful storytelling. And we all love those stories. How historical it is, I, I can't say. But in the end, the Hebrews thought that in the area they finally settled in, in the mountains of Canaan or Palestine or Transjordan, there were 12 groups that were confederated. And the names are the 12 sons of Jacob or Israel. So uh, there was not a lot of unity at that time. The Judges are a period of uh, unclear time. If you look at the Judges book in the Bible carefully, each, each judge comes from a different tribe. It's just like the poet saying, well, this judge was from that tribe, and each tribe gets its due. There are about 12 judges, just as there are 12 tribes. But the main tribes are the northern tribes and the southern tribes. The northern tribes are the Joseph tribes, the descendants of Joseph, who he gets two parts according to the um, uh, apportionment of Joshua. And of course, who is Joshua descended from? Dan. How many have ever heard of Joshua? Is he from Dan? No. Guess who he's descended from? Of course, the one you think, Joseph. He's a descendant of Joseph. That's why you know, he's the northern hero. The southern hero is Judah. And his descendant, David. That's how these stories get told to the poets who retrospectively tell the people in their time what their ancestors did. Joshua is a descendant. Jo Joseph has two sons in the Bible. I see you guys don't read the Bible that much. <coughs> but you know more about uh, Mickey Mouse than the Bible, actually. But in any case, uh, who are Joseph's two sons? And Ephraim. And Ephraim. Okay, which one is, is Joshua the son of Ephraim? Right. Yeah. yeah, good. Thank you. You guys must go to chapel or chapel or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, he's, he's, from, he's from Ephraim. Ephraim is the principal tribe of the north, though no one has ever heard of it in the normal one of people's knowledge. And that is Joshua's tribe. It goes Joseph, Ephraim, Joshua. That's his genealogy. And he's the leader of the Northern Tribes. So I've always suspected Jesus' genealogy because Jesus is Joshua in Hebrew. And guess who his father is? Joseph. It's too, it's too pat. It may be, it may have, it may represent this tribal affiliation of who Joshua was. Because there's other indications, if you read my James, the brother of Jesus book, that um, the father was called something entirely different. Which is why I knew the recent ossuary that came to the forum was a forgery. 
because it was too packed. Um, I think uh, Christine printed out some copies of this article we did in the LA Times that we mentioned to you. I suppose uh, if they want a copy, they can have one. You want to pass out a copy? I think well, I'll keep a few myself. I think that should do it. So, so that, 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 that has to do with the James Oshawa. But the whole point was it said Jesus, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And uh, the son of Joseph was highly questionable because none of the sources really ever say that Joseph was James' father. They're intent on saying he wasn't, because they don't want Jesus and Joseph to have the same father, Jesus and James to have the same father, even the same mother. But in any case, that's all in my James, the brother of Jesus book. You can read that should you ever want to. Um, thanks for copying those, Christina. It's really nice of you. I'm sure the class would like it. Um, well, would appreciate you having done it. In any case, I, that's something beyond our scope at the moment. Who? Jesus' his father was, if we can speak historically about him uh, in any real way or not. That's something we'll have to talk about at some point, probably. But um, the Joshua Joseph connection, the Jesus Joseph Joseph connection, is something very old in the storyline of the Bible. Okay, so by the time of Joshua, we're about 1200, and then David unifies the country. He struggles with Saul, who's the northern representative, and David's the southern representative. And for a while, we have unity of all the tribes, but and the temple is built. So the temple is built around, I think, 1040 or so BC, 1020 BC, something around that time under David. And then it's finished under Solomon, maybe 1020, something like that. That's the first temple. So Solomon is David's son, and he keeps the tribes together. David, by the way, comes from what city? He's born in Bethlehem, supposedly, but he comes from, that's by the way why Jesus has to get born in Bethlehem too. But uh, what, 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 why, um, let's see, he comes from Hebron. And um, Hebron is a place that Jews and Arabs are still fighting about today. And what are they mainly fighting over? There's a shrine there, what's it called? the tomb of the patriarchs. Because the claim is that the shrine in Hebron, which is in the Judean area, in fact, the Israelis are trying to build a wall there now because they just had some bus bombings in Beersheba, which they say came from Hebron. So the people of Beersheba are being angry because they want uh, to be protected. And they say the government isn't protecting them because the international people are putting pressure on the Israeli government not to build the wall, and the wall stops terrorists. So, uh, they've started building the wall again, uh, because they had two recent horrible bus bombings in Bishop. They don't care about children either, the bus bombers. In any event, uh, David comes from Hebron, and then the Bible tells you he conquered Jerusalem, which was not under Israelite control. It was under um, Jebusite, supposedly another group of people, Canaanite type people, and uh, I'm sure wouldn't be descendants of Ishmael <laughs> and so on. But in any case, um, when David conquered Jerusalem, he unifies the northern and southern tribes for a while. Solomon continues, but in the Bible even there's nasty stories told about Solomon, aren't there? Like Solomon's origins are told in a nasty way. David is on his rooftop and he sees a beautiful woman taking a shower on another rooftop and he likes the look of her and he finds out she's married to some foreign guy called Uriah the Hittite and then uh, he sends Uriah out tells the commander to put him in the front line of the battle and Uriah's a real nice guy when he comes back to see his wife because he's out in the battle he won't even go in and sleep with his wife that's a way of course of making sure that Solomon is David's child. You know, the Bible is all very clever in what it does. And that doesn't want to undermine Solomon's uh, origins. So it has Uriah sleeping out in the, out in the uh, stairwell there when he comes to visit his wife because he doesn't want to lose his battlefield purity. He's not even Jewish, though. That's the weird thing, unless he's been a convert of some kind. It's all very, con all very confusing. The book of Samuel is a very confusing book. I'm probably going to do it as a graduate class 
next year because I want to go through some of those books with the students. In any event, um, that story is a nasty story about Solomon's origins. That David was nasty, and the scrolls talk about that, by the way. The Damascus document is worried about David's sins. And when it's talking about things, it says, well, what about the sins of David? And it, and it answers that question. I don't want to uh, prejudge it, but the Damascus document that Etsy scrolls answers about the sins of Jacob. He says, well, I'll tell you the answer. Let God judge him. We shall not judge him. And the sins of Jacob, I'll um, uh, tell you here, it says here, while we're at it here, um, see if I can find it quickly for you. Let's see, because I think he's talking about marrying only one wife and uh, things of that kind and not divorcing wives. And, and um, fornication and different and here it is. And it was revealed and it's in column five. And regarding those entering the ark, two by two they went into the ark. And as for the ruler, the prince, it is written, he shall not multiply wives unto himself, Deuteronomy. But David, he had not read the sealed book of the law, which was in the ark of the covenant, meaning the book of Deuteronomy. Because that wasn't discovered in, if you read your Bible, around the 700s. Since it was not open in Israel after the days of Eliezer and Joshua the elders who served Ashtar, and they hid it, and it was not revealed till Zadok rose again, and the works of David rose up except for the blood of Uriah. And God counted them to him. So basically, what they're saying here is that um, they're not going to judge him. Uh, all his other works did rise up, but as for David, God would have to judge his sinfulness or his lack of sin. But you see, they're, they're very clever. They're actually talking about the things that interest us. And that's, you know, one of the most important documents from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we'll get to that, don't worry, we will get to that. Okay, so um, Solomon's origins are impugned somewhat. David Took his took him from took his mother from a man in an illegitimate manner, and there would be I'm sure questions about who really fathered him and stuff. This is just the nasty stories uh, like you get about Bill Clinton or someone else, even in our own time. Political leaders always have nasty stories told about them, and um, those times were no different than ours. But Solomon, after his death, his heirs could not hold the kingdom together, and it split up into northern kingdom and southern kingdom. That's the period of the divided monarchy. Israel in the north, Judah after David's tribe in the south. Jerusalem is under the control of Judah. The tribes go pretty, pretty far apart. You get down to the 9800s, 700s. The north is probably more prosperous because it's more involved in the coastal trade with Lebanon and Phoenicia. The south is pretty much a backwater, but it's a hill. It's a hill state, and therefore it's probably protected to some extent from a lot of incursions. Its main problem are the Philistines, the sea people I told you about last time, I think. In any event, um, the prophets who begin to rise up, the written ones in the 700s BC, right before the destruction of the north, anticipate the destruction of the north by the Assyrians. And I, one of the reasons the prophets are probably preserved is that the South thinks it's been miraculously saved. And the prophets are sort of the witnesses to the miraculous salvation of the South. Amos, first part of Isaiah, Micah, some of the other prophets witness all these things. I think they were really getting historical. To my mind, these are historical documents. Amos is totally historical to my mind. And that's a 700 BC document. So by this time, we're getting really historical in the Bible. And um, the southern kingdom, Judea, limps along under Davidic kings for another 100 years or so, 150 years. And then it, too, succumbs to, the, as we told you, the Babylonian conquest, which is in phases 610 to about 585 or so. And then the temple is destroyed. And that's the first temple. That's the whole temple from 
David and Solomon down to Nebuchadnezzar. We get into a period of uh, Babylonian captivity or uh, you know, the north is gone. But apparently it isn't. So we don't know how much they were, they were taken away, how much they weren't, how much it was just a decapitation of the uh, upper classes. How, I'm sure that the people on the land stayed. So the north was also known by the name of Samaria because that was the capital of the north. After a while, it was changed several times. And the northern residue of the northern groups became known in, over time by the New Testament period as Samaritans. After the capital of Samaria. And that's the person you get in the New Testament as a Samaritan. So there are residues of the northern tribes. Some southern tribes don't think much of them. And therefore are always uh, talking about them in a negative way. And they don't think much of the south. You can look at Samaritan literature, they're not very happy about the southern groups. And they don't like the Davidic temple. They have their own temple on the uh, mountains that Joshua's picture is being on. Yeah. And, and did, did some of that also have to do with, with the Jews being carried away to captivity when they returned? They found a lot of the, of the Jews that had remained that had mixed with the Yeah, that's part of the story in the Ezra and Nehemiah books. Uh, but um, I think it goes deeper than that. I think, um, well, let's go back to the, to the captivity. When the Babylonians took people away, I don't think they took all the people away. You couldn't, I know you see pictures of this whole mass of hundreds of thousands of people in a long line marching through the desert or something. I don't think they did that. They just took the, uh, the influential classes, the scribe classes, the, the nobility, the aristocracy, the military uh, caste, let's say. They're the ones that they would transport and bring others in their place. Now, the question you're asking, According to the southern tribes, a lot of people were resettled in the north from foreign places by the Assyrian and Babylonian kings. Whether that was true or not, I have no idea. And uh, later on, they claimed Greeks and Romans were settled there, too. And it could be. I mean, these things happen all the time, this kind of thing. So it's hard to keep, uh, but if, uh, keep track of all. But the Samaritans still exist today, you know. There's some about two or three hundred of them living in this place where all the uh, Palestinian uh, Nationalism is going on in Naples. How many have heard of Naples? It's north of Jerusalem. Do you know what it's from, Naples? The word? You can always find a root if you look. Greek. Greek word. In Arabic, there's no P. There's only a B. So in Arabic, when you say B, P, you're saying B. So if you want to talk about the Pope, you say Baba. If you want to talk about Paris, you say Paris. If you want to say Neapolis or Constantinople, you say Constantinople, Strobel, Strobel, Istanbul. And the P turns into a B and you get Istanbul. The same with Neapolis. Neapolis? Is it a new city? Yeah, new city on the old city of, the Hebrew city of Shechem, they used to be there. Neopolis, 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 Neopolis. That's how it goes. That's how language works. I'm a really good one. How many have ever heard of Andalusia? Oh, that's a romantic place, isn't it? Andalusia. It's the Arab name for Spain. It's the Arab name for Spain. It comes from Al-Andalus, Al-Andalus. Al-Andos, Al-Andos, Al-Vandos, it's where the Vandals, where the Romans sent the Vandals, who then went to North Africa. The Arabs came across North Africa, they met the descendants of the Vandals, and they said, oh, where do you come from there? Al-Andos, Al-Andos, Andos, Al-Andos, Andalusia. Comes from the word Vandals. I'm giving you my most precious secrets. <laughs> It took me a lifetime to learn these things. I hope you don't forget them. You can impress a lot of people with those things. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, Nablus is Neapolis, right? New City. And it's the new Greek city on the old Hebrew city of Shechem. 
city built by the Greeks and the Romans. Don't ask the Arabs what Nablus means because they wouldn't be able to tell you. It's not their fault. It's just people who don't study history don't learn these things. That's all. If your history only begins in 600 AD, then you don't know anything. It's as simple as that. And when you're permitted to study these things, then you can, and you're a very smart group, and you will. But until such time as they're able to, it's not going to happen, I guess. In any event, um, the Babylonian captivity. How many were taken away? We don't know. But I assume some people stayed on the land. And uh, what happened about 50 years later when the first returnees come back, the king is Zerubbabel. What's that mean? Well, Babel is Babylon. Zeru is something to do with shoot or you know, plant or root. Shoot of David born in Babylon. That's all that name. You know, you see this name Zerubbabel, and it sounds like some weird name. That's because when it comes in English, it's it's weird. But in Hebrew, it's not weird. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel. Babel is Babylon. Zeru is shoot. In other words, he's a descendant of David in Babylon. And uh, something happens to him because we don't, and he comes back with another high priest also called Jesus or Joshua. Um, I think his name is Jesus, Josephus tells us, or the Bible tells us. Josephus writes in Greek, so he calls him Jesus. The Bible calls him Yehoshua or Joshua. Ben Yehosedek. Yehosedek was the last high priest of the Davidic period before the captivity. He's the son of the last high priest. He comes back from with, with this Zerubbabel. We have a dual leadership therefore, a, a, a secular leader, a Davidic leader, and a priestly leader. Somehow, and this is what I start to do in the Maccabees Zadokites, so I pick up the history here. In the Maccabees Zadokites book, I pick up the history here. Somehow, the Davidic leader comes to a bad end, probably because he was seen as an absurd or a subversive and trying to set up a kingdom or be a revolutionary. And he um, drops out of the picture. But I think we still have a picture of him in Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet who represents several stages of writing. An early stage, uh, probably a middle stage, a later stage. Anyway, one of the stages just picks pictures a suffering servant. And a lot of people think that, though I know the modern religious view is that's Jesus. But let's face it, this is written 500 years before Jesus. And it's a picture of something that was happening at that time. And um, a lot of people think it's something what happened to Zerubbabel. But in any case, he, something happened to him. And by the time we history reemerged from this period, we have a, a Persian type government where priests are in control. Because the priests have conquered uh, Babylonia and the Persians were led basically by a priest class and they had a sort of caste system like the Brahmins in, in India where the priest class was on top and by the time Palestine re-emerges into written or the light of history we're, we have a kind of priestly colony or uh, what would you call it, a semi-independent country, something uh, semi-autonomous country under the Persian rule which is ruled by priests, it's theocracy. And um, the first return in the Persian period, which is covered in Isaiah, because Isaiah actually has the material in chapter 40 onwards, the material in Isaiah that we all apply to Jesus and sing about in Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. Uh, you know, the make a way in the wilderness material that starts with Isaiah 40. And all the other material that Handel took from uh, Isaiah. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Aronson, and all that sort of stuff. It's all quotes out of Isaiah. Anyway, what Isaiah is celebrating is, unfortunately, I know it's not very uh, attractive to know, but it happens to be the case, is the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity. That's the highway in, in the desert where God is going to put water so the returnees can come back. And if you take an Old Testament class with me sometime, I'll read you all of Isaiah and you'll see that that's true. And often the suffering servant is the whole people Israel in the Isaiah view. Now, I mean, 
you can take things out of context and interpret them any way you want. The same as Paul does with um, Hagar and the Jews being the descendants of the slave women. No, that's fine. And you can make uh, your whole theology and history of the picture you have of the what happened in Palestine agree with Isaiah's picture of a suffering servant. That's fair enough. But the fact is Isaiah didn't know anything about what was going to happen 400 or 500 years later. I know we think he did, but I don't think that a reasonable person you would think he did. People knew Isaiah and therefore modeled what they were talking about on the basis of Isaiah. However, be that as it may, the point is that all of the material in, from chapter 40 on in Isaiah relates to the return of the Jews from captivity. Because we actually have the designation of Cyrus and the way the Jews presented it, the Jews went to Cyrus and said, you know, our great God has, has, has envisioned you. Our God has given you the power to, 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 uh, to uh, destroy the Babylonian kingdom. It's all in Isaiah 40 to 46. You can read it. And then it says, it says, it actually quotes Cyrus, the Persian ruler at that time, which is, this is 540 B.C. or something. Actually quotes it. And says, let it be inhabited, let them re be, be rebuilt. In other words, Cyrus gives the order that the Jews can return and can re-inhabit their country and rebuild their towns. He does this because as it's presented to him, I think what happened is the Jews presented Isaiah to them as if he was being predicted. And it says, Cyrus, my Moshiach. Cyrus, my Messiah. Cyrus, my anointed one. He will, he will accomplish my whole plan. It's all in Isaiah if you read it. That's about Isaiah 44. I could read it to you if you don't believe me. You know that people don't believe these things. I'll tell you here, I'll read you a little bit of Isaiah here before we move on to Daniel. So here we go. I'll just pick up Isaiah 40. Console my people, console them, comfort them, speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Tell her her time of service is ended. Her sins have been atoned for. That's the people in captivity who are going to return. I know it's supposed to be Jesus according to how we chorus. But that's not what Isaiah is saying. That's a later interpretation. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare in the wilderness a way for you and make a straight highway for our God across the desert. Let every valley be filled in and every mountain and hill be laid low, etc., etc., etc. Go up to the high mountain, joyful messenger of Zion. Shout with a voice, joyful messenger of Jerusalem. Shout without fear. Say to the towns of, of Judah and so on. Here is the Lord coming with power. Islands, the Greeks, hear me, and so on. Jacob, puny might, Israel, poor soul. Uh, and he goes on like that into chapter 41. You, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. And he goes on to tell the whole history of their, uh, of their situation. Jacob, poor worm, Israel, puny might, I will help you. It's the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer, who speaks. Uh, and then this material. In the wilderness I will put cedar trees, acacias, olives. In the desert I will plant juniper. I will make rivers well up and barren heights and fountains in the midst of valleys and turn the wilderness into a lake. I will not abandon you. Then finally it gets to Cyrus. I roused him from the north to come from the rising sun, the east. I summoned him by name. I called him by name, Zion. Uh, by, uh, I called him by name, Cyrus. He trampled the satraps like water. I had said in Zion before, and here they come. I had sent a prayer of good news to Jerusalem. Anyway, that gets us to 42. Uh, let's see now. We go on to 43. But now says the, God, the Lord who created Jacob and Israel, Do not be afraid. I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Called by name will be very important in the scrolls. If you pass through the sea, I will be with you. If you go through rivers, they will not swallow you up. Um, I give, and he talks about parting the, the Red Sea for Moses. Uh, I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you up from the west. To the north I will say, give up. To the south, do not hold back. Bring back my sons from more far away, my, my daughters from the ends of the earth. The beginning of this restoration, that's going to happen. 
Uh, Thus says the Lord, who made a way through the sea, a path of the great warrior, wars, who put chariots and horses in the field. That's the Moses uh, parting the Red Sea. Huh, but look, no need to recall the past. No need to think about what was done then. See, I'm going to do a new deed. Even now, it comes to life. Can you not see it? I'm making a road in the wilderness. A way in the wilderness, pass in the wild. I'm putting water in the wilderness to give my chosen people drink. Uh, now, this can be allegoricalized, but at the moment, it has to do with a new miracle like the old miracle. 44. Now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb. Uh, who is your help? Do not be afraid, my servant. And so on and so forth. Um, then he goes on here into 45, where we're finally getting into where we're going. The servant, you see, is Jacob, who confirms the word of my servant and makes plans of my envoy succeed. I am he who says of Jerusalem, let her be inhabited. And the towns of Judah, let them be rebuilt. And I will raise their ruins once more. And I am he who says of the ocean, be dry. And I will dry up rivers. I am he who says of Cyrus, my shepherd, he will fulfill my whole purpose, saying of Jerusalem, let her be rebuilt. And of the temple, let her foundation be laid. Now you see, we can't get any clearer than that. We're in Isaiah 45, and um, this is a poor translation. It says, not Cyrus my shepherd, Cyrus my Messiah, it says. You know David Koresh in Waco, Texas? You know why he called himself Koresh? The fellow who was burned up by the U.S. government in that weird settlement down there? Do you know why he called That wasn't his name. You know why he took the name Koresh? Koresh is the Hebrew for Cyrus. And he knew that Cyrus in Isaiah had been called my Messiah. So he wanted to be called the Messiah, so he took the name David Kurash, which is the Hebrew for Cyrus, the Persian king, who was called in Isaiah, my Messiah. Okay, I am the God, I form the light in the dark, I send victory like dew, and, and so on and so forth. It goes on like that. Uh, but um, you can read it yourself. But the point being here is that um, Cyrus is going to accomplish everywhere uh, all of his, everything that God wants. Go away from Babylon, flee from the twelve ends, declare with cries of joy, proclaim it, send it to the ends of the earth. He always has redeemed his, has redeemed his servant Jacob. Those he led through the dead desert never went thirsty. He made water spring up from the rock. He split the rock and water flowed. There is no happiness, and so on. And then in chapter 49, you mountains break into happy cries. Yahweh consoles his people. You see, the consolation is not Jesus Christ here at all. I mean, that's how people read it who don't read the Bible. But that's not what Isaiah says. That's what later people interpreting it say. Because it says, For Yahweh consoles his people and takes pity on the afflicted. For Zion was saying, Yahweh has abandoned me. The Lord has, has forgotten me. Does a woman forget her baby and fail to cherish the son of a woman? Yet even if these forget, I will never forget you. See, I have engraven you upon the rampart, upon the palms of my hands. Your ramparts are always under my eyes. Your builders make haste. Your, des your destroyers and despoiler depart. Your desolate places, your ruins, your devastated country will now be too small for all its inhabitants. And you will say, the place is too small for me. Give me more space. And who has born you? I was childless and barren and brought me up and so on. So on. Okay, I don't want to read any more of this. You can read that if you're interested in reading prophecy. You see in Isaiah. But just saying the gist of it, what I'm telling you about is Isaiah relates to the return of the Jewish people from captivity. And the joy that the messenger is spreading is to tell the people that they are returning. Well, it doesn't exactly happen that way. And... Some things come to a bad end. We don't know what happened to Zerubbabel. We know that Cyrus did tell them to go back, but it didn't all come out the way they planned. How do we know this? Because there's a gap. A hundred years later, we have two other books, Ezra and Nehemiah. And when Ezra and Nehemiah come back, nothing has happened. I mean, there are, are returnees, but they haven't built any walls. They haven't built the temple. They've hardly, they're at the mercy of all the foreign peoples around them. 
And it turns out that Ezra is the cupbearer in the Persian court. He's probably a eunuch because of that. And he um, sponsors Nehemiah, it looks like. In any case, this is the last clear stuff in the Bible. But Ezra, this is what you're talking about, I think, over there. Ezra reads the people the law for the first time, according to the book of Ezra, as if they never had heard it before. And this is around 450 B.C. German scholars of uh, the 19th, of the 1800s, the 19th centuries, thought that that meant that the law and everything, the mosaic the material, was all written by Ezra. And that's called the Wellhausen School. I don't think that's true completely. Ezra may have had a lot to do with it, but the point is the prophets who were certainly in the 700 BC know the whole previous history anyway. Amos talks about Moses. Amos talks about the Red Sea parting. Isaiah knows about the Red Sea parting and all that sort of thing. So, I mean, uh, this didn't happen in Ezra's time. Uh, literature in the 700s, 800s BC already knows about these things. And the laws in the Bible probably reflect the Davidic period. Anyway, I'm getting too far afield. The point is, when Ezra and Nehemiah come back in the 450s, nothing is done. They lay the foundations for the Second Temple. And it's under them that the Second Temple is built. So this is what we call the Second Temple period. We go into a dark hole. We've been in a dark hole since the 500s, when we have... Um, the return from the captivity under Zerubbabel and the, and the high priest uh, Joshua, the son of the previous high priest. And so for two or three hundred years we don't have any idea what's happened. We have Josephus in his antiquities that tells us a little bit about this period. I don't know how reliable it all is. But really we know more about, let's say, the time of David than we know about 400, 300 BC. So just because the thing is further back in time, it doesn't mean that we know a lot about it. What it does tell us is if there's written documents about a certain period, they light up that period. They illumine that period. So when we have good written documents for a period, we know a lot about it. We know a lot about the Egyptian period in the 1300 BC under Ignaton and so on. I think we know nothing hardly about 800 BC. We know a lot about the period in Israel from about 1000 BC to 800 BC, even coming down further. But we don't hardly know anything about 450 BC to 200 BC. And then Alexander bursts on the scene. That's a really easy date. We're going to get two movies in his name coming up this, this fall, I hear. Alexander the Great movies. He's suddenly in vogue for some reason. I don't know how. I hope they're not as bad as the. Uh, Achilles movie that we saw with Brad Pitt. Besides his rear end, I mean, there was probably nothing in that movie that was worthwhile looking at, actually. It was a totally stupid movie. It reduced the Iliad to about three days when the Iliad takes place over a 10 or 12 year period. I mean, it was a totally preposterous, stupid movie. And it's sad that they would butcher a classic like that in such a silly way when they could have actually presented it in, in its real substance and had a beautiful movie anyway. But I don't know what caused the movie makers to do what they do. Hope they don't do that with Alexander. In any event, he, Alexander's easy. He appears on the scene in 333 BC. So that's an easy day. So in 333, Alexander appears. And we're going to get him referred to in Daniel. And, you know, he's like a kind of lightning rod, a hard charging beast. And that's how he's portrayed in, in Daniel, as a wild goat that comes out of the West. We can actually, I know all the preachers on television love to apply Daniel to every period, because Daniel is esoteric literature. It's not, it doesn't tell you about what it means. It uses animal symbolism to represent kings and kingdoms. It, for instance, uses leopards to represent the Persians, and bears to represent the Medes, I think, and goats to represent the Greeks, and horns to represent different kings. And of course, people have been, who don't know this are awestruck by Daniel and think, oh my God, Daniel is relentless. Everyone thinks it relates to their own time. So if you live in the time of Dante, you think it's that time. If you live in the time of, um, of Lyndon Johnson, then you think it's that time. If you live in our time, a lot of preachers think it's our time. 
they don't have a good stuff anymore because in the time of Johnson they had the king of the north, the king of the south, they had the Russians, the Chinese communists, they could do the whole thing of Daniel in terms of all these horrible powers that were besieging America and the Holy Land. And they could get themselves really whipped up in a pretty good sermon. But unfortunately, Daniel had nothing to do with all that. The rabbis didn't like that. The rabbis thought it wasn't prophecy. It was a new, it was, it was a new form of literature. It was called what we now call, I don't know what they call it, apocalypse. It was not prophecy in the sense that it had a moral lesson and that it painted things directly in terms of moral terms. Prophecy isn't really prophecy. Prophecy reads moral lessons into the affairs of men and women. Daniel just portrays things in a wild, sort of uh, apocalyptic manner. Uh, the book of Revelation in the, in the New Testament is in the style and tradition of Daniel. The rabbis, therefore, didn't put Daniel among the prophets. The rabbis, you know, divided the Old Testament up into three different, um, three different, uh, three different sections. And that's what the Jews look at. That's how the Jews look at the Bible now. But the Jewish Bible is a little different. The Jews call their Bible Tanakh. Torah, it's an acronym. Prophets, which in Hebrew is Nivi'im. Writings, which in Hebrew is Ketuvim. In the sending order of holiness, the law is the most holy, the prophets the next most holy, the writings, the rabbi said, don't even dirty the hands in the sense of make the hands impure. Now the, 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 the rabbis put Daniel, they couldn't get rid of him altogether. They didn't like him, but they couldn't get rid of him altogether. They put him into writing. One of the reasons they didn't like him, I think, is Daniel has to do with the Maccabean uprising. And we'll see that now in a moment. So they didn't see that as a prophetical book and a new style literature. And it's very interesting. There's another book that's very similar to Daniel that didn't get in the Old Testament. It's called Enoch. Enoch is found at, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, very popular in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the literature we call apocryphal to some extent. In any event, Daniel is someone that Jeremiah mentions in the 600s BC. But the way Daniel is put together uh, it tries to look as if Daniel is in 600 BC in the time of the Babylon. <coughs> But actually, when you look at the visions he has, you realize that the writer who was writing in his name, and therefore we call this, in the language of our field, pseudepigraphy. False writings. It's not really false writings. It's writings under a false pen name. But you see, we now think just about everything in this field is pseudepigraphy. I mean, we don't think Mark wrote Mark, we don't think John wrote John, we don't think um, Luke wrote Luke, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so scholars actually think all books are mostly pseudepigraphy. And in Greek history, as it developed, the Greek historians were willing to put their own ideas into other people's mouths. That was normal. Thucydides was the first one. Thucydides wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, if you're familiar with that. That was the time of Pericles and the Acropolis and Athens. And he could give you Pericles' whole speech. He didn't give you Pericles' whole speech. He made up Pericles' speech. That's what the Greeks thought it was okay to do, that you could write someone's speech for them. So when you read this, an ancient speech, they didn't have any tape recorders. You always have to ask, were you there, Charlie? That's the question. When we get these different speeches by different heroes, I don't want to mention any names, we think those are historical. They may or may not. If they are, someone had to put them in memory and preciously pass them down. If not, someone made it up and wrote their own ideas into that person's mouth. Very famous philosopher did this. Ever hear of Plato, Socrates? Plato put all his ideas into Socrates' mouth. How many have read Plato? So when you read Plato, you're reading about Socrates, aren't you? But we don't know if it's Socrates' ideas or Plato's ideas half the time. Because every idea Plato had, he attributed to Socrates. And he made Socrates his mouthpiece. And that was considered le legitimate in Greek 
philosophical and historical writing. Thucydides makes up all the speeches of his heroes, and Plato puts his ideas on, in, under Socrates' name. And modern people like us are not familiar with that. We have uh, honest, we give people the benefit of the doubt. We have good feeling towards them. We're, we're, we, we think that they're uh, always going to be uh, straightforward with us and uh, trustworthy. And in fact, you have to be careful of everything that you, that you have to be sure that that is what that person said or that came from that person. And you can, you can do that, but you have to you know, work hard on it. In any event, Daniel is presented as being in the Babylonian period. But from different prophecies that we're going to look at now, the author, and you'll see I'm going to show you that why that's true, knows everything that happens more or less down to the period of the Maccabean uprising, which is what the Jews call Hanukkah, which we'll talk about another time, but in any case, Hanukkah is the story of the Maccabean uprising, <coughs> which is 3, uh, 175 or so BC. Covered in the Maccabee book, supposedly. Which are not in the Jewish Bible, but are in the Greek Bible. I'll explain that to you, too, presently why it got into the Catholic Bible who don't celebrate Hanukkah and the Jews don't have any books about Hanukkah. Another contradiction uh, uh, and the oddity of history. Why don't the Catholics celebrate Hanukkah? It's all announced in their Bible. They're not interested. The Jews celebrate Hanukkah, but they don't have any books about it. Because their Bible didn't have the Maccabee books. They were conserved in the Greek Latin Bible. What we call now the Apocrypha. That's another story I don't want to get into now because I want to. Uh, I only have a certain amount of time left, and I want to keep on our subject here. So, um, the writer of Daniel, and Daniel seems to be uh, sort of um, a hodgepodge of a lot of different traditions, some of which might be quite old. But the person who finally put it all together, his information comes down to the Maccabean uprising, and we can actually precisify it. We can say that he knows that the uprising took place, but he doesn't know the outcome. For instance, he doesn't know Judas Maccabee is killed. So he's an eyewitness to the events in question. He knows that the temple has been desecrated. He knows that the abomination of the desolation referred to in the New Testament in the Gospels has been put up in the temple. He knows what the abomination of the desolation is, even though most people nowadays don't. What is the abomination of the desolation? It's a phrase which he, he refuses to call what the abomination is what it is. It's the statue of the Olympian Zeus, which the Greeks built in the temple instead of the Hebrew altar in the Maccabean period. He won't, it's like someone say, Joe Schmo. He has a Hebrew word, I don't know what it is, but he has a Hebrew word that he puts in place of that uh, Olympian Zeus because he won't speak it. And that comes out in Hebrew as abomination of the desolation in English. In other words, he won't say Olympian Zeus, he curses it in effect. A Greek wouldn't have any trouble saying it at all. <laughs> you know, so. Any case, so he, he knows that that's happened. He knows everything is in ruins. He knows there's a war going on. He knows the saints, who is the Maccabean army, the saints of the Most High God, are going to win this war, but he doesn't know how, why, and when. And he doesn't know that the leader of the saints, Judas Maccabee, is killed. So we can say that he's writing right in the midst of the Maccabean uprising, right as it's going on, but not afterwards. In other words, he knows everything came before, but nothing afterwards. You say, well, how does that prove anything? Well, if someone knows everything that came before something, and nothing that came after something, and he demonstrates this over and over and over again, you normally think that it's because that's when he lived. Up to that time and no further. Oh, if you believe in uh, miracles, you can say up to that time and no further, but he actually lived 400 years before. But still, if he lived 400 years before, how come he doesn't know about John Kennedy, if he knows so much? How come he doesn't know about Julius Caesar? How come he doesn't know all these other things? It's because he lived in this time, probably. But let's look at it. Let's take a look. Daniel, quickly. Before we go home, because I promised Daniel today, and I got excited. Uh, here we go. If you've got a Bible, let's look at it. I'll get you into it. Next time we'll finish up Daniel, we'll read Maccabees 1. 
Uh, your assignments are read Daniel, Maccabees 1, Maccabees 2. If you get fed up with all that, by the end of the, uh, by the time of the midterm, you should have read Josephus, Jewish War, up to approximately the start of the war. If you don't want to read about the war, I can well understand it. That's about 150 pages of Josephus. Because when you get into the war in Josephus, it gets really nitty gritty and boring. Save that for your summer vacation on the beach, because uh, you probably don't have time for it while you're working so hard in your classes. So I can understand. So if you read the first 150, 75 pages of Josephus up to the start of the war, that's sufficient. You don't have to get down to the details of the war. So if, if you want to read more than that, that's fine. Anyway, do that by the midterm. That's all your work for the midterm. I just gave it to you. Let's look at Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched on Jerusalem. And here we get the story of Hanan, Meshach, and Azariah, and Abednego, and these people. And uh, Daniel, you see, in line 7, is also has a, has a uh, Babylonian name. He's called Baltichet Shazar. It's all very confusing. This might be old material. We don't know about this material, and I am not going to judge this material. But newer material, if this is old material, has been tacked on. So this material has Daniel living at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And he's also got a Babylonian name, Balthazar. But later on, Balthazar is a Babylonian king. We don't even know anything about it. So how he differs from Balthazar, I don't know. This book is <coughs> terribly confused. But what's interesting is chapter 2. The king has a dream. 36. There was a dream. Now we will explain to the king what it means. Daniel interprets dreams like Joseph. You, O king, king of kings, Babylonian king, to whom the God of heaven has given sovereignty, power, strength, glory, sons of men, the beasts, the field, the birds of heaven, wherever they are, he's entrusted to your rule, making you king. You are a golden head. Now we get the prophecies. And after you, another kingdom will rise, not as great as you. And then a third of bronze, which will rule the whole world. Then a fourth kingdom, hard as iron, as iron that shatters and crushes all, like iron that breaks everything to pieces. So four kingdoms. So this is the mysterious nature of Daniel that can apply to any time and place. It will crush and break all the earlier kingdoms. Daniel always comes up to this fourth kingdom, which is probably Alexander the Great. In this particular version, it's not so clear, but later versions in the book will be clear. That's how it down the great. The feet you saw apart of them were apart of iron in our kingdom, which will split in two, but which will retain something of the strength of iron, just as you saw the iron and clay of the earthenware mixed together. The feet were part iron, part earthenware. The kingdom will be partly strong, partly weak. And just as you saw the iron and clay of the earthenware mixed together, so too will be mixed together the seed of man. But they will not hold together any more than iron will blend with earthenware. In the time of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not pass in the hands of another race. It will shatter and absorb all the previous kingdoms and itself last forever. Just as you saw the stone untouched by hand break from the mountain and shatter iron, brass, earthware, silver, gold, the great God has shown the king what is to take place. The dream is true, the interpretation exact. What do we have here announced for the first time? We're on our way to Christianity. That's why probably the rabbis don't like this. Because it's talking about what? The eternal kingdom. The eternal kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. This is the first real discussion of the kingdom of heaven. It's not that they're against anything as such as Christianity, it's just they don't like books that get people worked up. And they blame the war against Rome, which is why they got rid of a lot of these books. They couldn't get rid of Daniel, it was too highly thought of. They got rid of the Maccabee books out of the Jewish Bible because they blamed the war against Rome on books like the Maccabee books. That they worked the people up and made them resist unnecessarily. The same as Kerry is blaming the Iraq war on Bush. And he thinks we don't have to fight it because we could use the money to save the poor people in America, if anyone would ever use the money in that way. And uh, we've wasted all the money out there. And uh, it's the same as this. It's the same as this. If we didn't have the Maccabee books, we wouldn't have fought the, the Romans. 
But the others can reply, well, if it didn't have Bin Laden, we wouldn't have to go to Iraq, and so on and so forth. So all these things go round and round. You don't decide what side of those arguments you are, but here's the first announcement of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so chapter 3, more about Nebuchadnezzar, a famous thing here about Azari and the furnace. These are all old pieces probably of Daniel. Not really terribly interesting. Line 37 of chapter 3. Um, Abraham here, by the way, is called friend of God, line 35, which he will be called also in uh, Islam, and which he will be called in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and which will be called in the letter of James. And hey, you promised descendants are countless as stars of heaven. That's from Genesis. Lord, now we are least of all nations. Now we are despised throughout the world. Today, because of our sins, we have at this time no leader, no prophet, no prince, no holocaust, no sacrifice, nothing. Uh, only a humble spirit and so on. So this is a time when the sacrifice is interrupted according to that particular song. Okay, well, um, then uh, there's a miracle that goes on at the end of that chapter. I see four men, line 92, walking about freely in the heart of the fire. And the force looks like a son of the gods, or a son of God. I don't know what that means, but anyway, son of God is mentioned there, if it's interesting. Chapter 4, more dreams. And it's interpreted in line 20 as a watcher. The watchers are a quantity that we find in Enoch. The watchers are very interesting in this period. They are superhuman beings of some kind, like angels. And Enoch talks about watchers. Enoch is a book found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, certain in Apocrypha, a lot of uh, yeah, outline regions around the world uh, concerned. Uh, that's the first note of, I'm skipping through all this stuff because to me it's not interesting the beginning of Daniel. It's only when we get to the real prophecies. Chapter 5, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet. What do you mean King Belshazzar? I thought Daniel was Belshazzar. Who's Belshazzar? I don't think the writer knows. Really, we're getting all kinds of kings. Daniel's still living. According to this, it says it's uh, the son of uh, King. Okay, that's fair enough. Maybe it is, but Daniel keeps living. Look at line 30 here. The numbering gets pretty skewed here, so it's hard to follow it. The same night, the Chaldean King Belshazzar was were murdered and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Darius the Mede? We're in the Persian period now. I mean, this is supposed to be Nebuchadnezzar, 600 BC. Now we're in like about 400 BC. This is the Medes and the Persian. Darius is not even the first king. He's one of the kings after Cyrus. Cyrus is in 500. Darius is in the 400s, I think, or, you know, early mid 500s. Anyway, I'm not a great expert on Persia, but you see now we're in Darius. Like line 26, King Darius then wrote to all men, I decree in every kingdom of my emperor, let the trouble of fear before the God of Daniel. He is the living God. He endures forever. His sovereignty will never be destroyed. His kingship will never end. He sets free work signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth. He saved Daniel from the power of the lions. And then Daniel flourished into the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So he's already living in Jeremiah's time. Now he's down and so he lives endless time, this Daniel. Now he's back in chapter 7 to Belshazzar's time. We'd already gotten to the, to the Persians. Now we're back to the Babylonians. So you see, this book's a mess. I mean, I don't care what you want to say about it, but it is a mess. But what happens here in chapter 7 is the great vision. So I'll just read you the great vision, and then we'll go home. All right? And you can think about the great vision until next week. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Now look here. In the other sections, Daniel is interpreting the um, dreams, right? And then from now on, Daniel doesn't interpret the uh, dreams. The angels come and interpret the dreams for him. He just has the dreams, and the angels come. Who's the interpreter of the dream from here on in? Gabriel. And by the way, the Muslims know this stuff because they read their Bible at that time. So who's the prophet? Who's the angel that reveals things to the prophet? Gabriel. 
Gabriel with Gabriel. But the first mention of Daniel, of Gabriel, is here in the book of Daniel. Here in the book of Daniel. Okay. So this is where Gabriel comes from, and we're going to meet him in a minute. Let's look at this quickly. Daniel had a dream of visions that passed through his head as he lay in his bed. He wrote the dream down, and this is how it begun. Daniel said, I saw visions in the night. I saw four winds of heaven restoring with great sea. Four great beasts emerged from the sea, each with the, with the other. The first was a lion with eagle wings. Here's the representation of kingdoms and kings. The wings are usually the kings. And I looked, its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground. That's probably the Babylonians. The winged lion was their symbol. The second beast I saw was different, like a bear with three ribs. Probably the Medes or the Persians. I have some footnotes here. It says that these are the Medes. Three ribs are the three kings, whoever the Medes kings were. They were in a joint empire with the Persians. Up oh, came the command, eat quantities of flesh. After this, I looked and saw another beast like a leopard, the Persians, with four birds, four kings of the Persians. My footnotes give you their names, I think. I don't really care. We can look at that. It had four heads and power was given to it. See, this is what they objected. This is not prophecy. This is apocalyptic now weird symbolic dreams that you don't know what they mean. Next I saw another vision in visions of the night. I saw a fourth beast, Alexander the Great. Fearful, terrifying, very strong. It had great iron teeth. And it ate, crushed, trampled underfoot what remained. It was different from the previous beast. It had ten horns. The Seleucid Kingdom succeeding Alexander the Great the ten kings under, until the evil king. That's what I mean. He brings us right down to the Maccabean period. The ten Seleucid kings down to the eleventh horn. The eleventh horn is Antiochus Epiphanes. The one who fought the Maccabees in the Maccabean uprising, which I will tell you about next week. While I was looking at these horns, I saw another horn. That's Antiochus Epiphanes. And we'll find that it matches up with the Maccabee books. Sprouting among them a little one. Three of the original horns were pulled out by the roots to make way for it. And this horn I saw had human eyes and a mouth full of boasts. Does he like this eleventh horn? No, he hates it. He hates this eleventh horn. Thrones were set up. One of great age took his seat. God. His robe was white as snow. His hair and his head was pure as wool. His throne was a blaze of flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Ezekiel's picture of the chariot. If you know Ezekiel. A stream of fire poured out, issuing from his presence a thousand, thousand waited on him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, a court was held, the books were opened. It's great literature though, you have to admit, it's a lot of fun. The great things the horn was saying were still ringing in my ears, Antiochus Epiphanes. And as I watched, the beast was killed, and the body destroyed, and committed to the flames, and the other beasts were deprived of their power, but received a lease on life for a season and a time. Here's Daniel's um, numerology. And I gazed in the visions of the night, and I saw, this is the most famous passage from Daniel that's picked up in the New Testament, one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. I saw coming on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. He came to the one of great age, was led into his presence, and on him was confirmed sovereignty, glory, kingship. Men of all peace, and peace, peoples, nations, languages became his servants. His sovereignty was an eternal sovereignty which shall never pass away, nor will his empire ever be destroyed. This in Christianity is the prophecy of Christ Jesus. So there's one problem here, and that is the word like a son of man. You see, it's in Aramaic, but if you look at it carefully and you'll see that that is the way it is, it is not the Son of Man, you see, as the Christian scripture starts to talk about Jesus. When you see the Son of Man doing this, when you see the Son of Man doing that, Son of Man in, in, in Hebrew is just Ben Adam. Ben Adam is Son of Adam. Adam and man are the same word. It's a normal thing in, uh, for instance, Israel today. You say, hey, be a Ben Adam. Be a man. Ben Adam actually means man. It means you're a son of Adam. A son of man. A son of Adam. But you see, this person is not a son of man. He only looks like a son of man. He is one who looks like a son of man. But he's not a son of man. He's a supernatural being or person. Because he's riding on the clouds. He only has the appearance of a man. He looks like a son of man. But in fact, he's something more. 
he is this eternal king, whatever he is going to be, whoever you interpret him. But you see, there is a fundamental error that crept into the scripture because the people writing the scripture were writing Greek. And they didn't understand Hebrew conceptualities and they were reading uh, manuscripts in, in a translation. And they began to think that one like of Son of Man was the Son of Man because they didn't understand Hebrew. Who's the first prophet that calls himself Son of Man? Well, if you read it, Ezekiel, you'll know. Ezekiel addresses himself over and over again as Son of Man prophesied, prophesied unto the wind, prophesied unto this, prophesied unto that. Ezekiel's a great prophet, and he uses Son of Man to refer to himself. It's a self-designation because he's a son of man. He's a son of Adam. He is not supernatural. He is not a son of God. But this being here only looks like a son of man. But he is not a son of man because he's on the clouds. He has an appearance of a son of man, but he's something more. And that's really what Daniel is saying, if you are fair. Not if you put your belief in the way. I don't have a belief either way, frankly. I don't believe the Christian view. I don't believe the Jewish view of things. I'm not pro-rabbinic. I'm not pro-Christian. I'm just pro the manuscript. And the manuscript says this, that I see one like a son of man. He has the appearance of the son of man, but he is not the son of man, you see. He is a son of man. Yeah? Doesn't that not necessarily contradict the Christian belief? I have no idea if it You have to decide that. I'm only saying what contradictory is the phrase, the son of man. There's no such thing as the son of man in the Hebrew in, in the Hebrew lexicography or, or vocabulary prior to the New Testament. But they think there is. They think this is what's expected, the Son of Man. And they're getting it from here, but they're misreading it. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't contradict them. I'm only saying that they have misunderstood the old the old material. Think about it. Don't put your belief in first place. Look at the text. The text does not say the Son of Man. There's no text in any Hebrew book that says the Son of Man. Son of man is a general phraseology applied to men as opposed to gods and angels. If you're a Benadam, you're a man. If you, if you knew Hebrew, you would know that. Because, you know, Benadam means to anybody who knows Hebrew, hey, behave, be a man, be a Benadam, be a son of Adam. Adam is the father of all mankind. So there isn't a the son of man. But you see, the people who think there is a the son of man have taken Daniel. I saw the Son of Man. If you see in the New Testament, this is quoted as, I saw the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, not one like a Son of Man. That's what happened. But anyway, you'll have to think about that. I'll leave you with that. I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want you to bulldoze. You have your own views. But I'm, this text.